name Kim Mai. I'm a writer for TechCrunch, and I cover a lot about gaming and mobile applications. Um, and today we're talking to like service providers. And when I was kind of organizing this panel and looking at it, I realized that none of you are actually direct competitors, which makes it like a little bit less fun. And each of these companies has a different core competency, like Urban Airship handles a lot of push, and Marmalade deals with game developers. So, I mean, maybe you can kind of go down the line and explain how your businesses are a little bit different, and then we can get into the meat of the panel. Sure. So I'm Tim. I'm the CTO at Marmalade. Um, we're a company offering cross-platform tools and services, um, especially for mobile apps. So we provide a cross-platform SDK, and we also provide services to help developers publish across multiple platforms. So I'm Jeff Haney. I'm co-founder and uh, CEO of AppSolidator. Um, we do make a platform as well called Titanium that allows you to build applications across different devices, uh, as well as a cloud service to allow you to connect those uh, apps to the cloud and, and, and leverage the connectivity of the cloud. Uh, I'm Matt Johnston, Chief Marketing Officer of Utest. We offer in the wild testing solutions. So we help mobile developers uh, figure out how their applications actually function and perform in the hands of users. Uh, I'm Scott Kavitan. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Urban Airship. I'm the one that Peter was giving grief to because he's, he's a hater about the pocket square. So that's fine. Uh, Urban Airship's a, a messaging platform for marketers. We help uh, marketers engage with consumers through these mobile devices. Uh, you know, everybody on the planet is going to have a smartphone in their hands in the next five years. And uh, uh, messaging through push notifications is such a fantastic channel for engaging consumers. Uh, and we're the folks building that platform. So it's kind of interesting is that um, a couple of the companies in this panel, you've transitioned a bit over the last year. For example, Accelerator ad added a mobile backend as a service. Um, and then Marmalade, you actually rebranded. Um, I'm kind of curious, um, and maybe we can hear from all of you, what kinds of uh, services are de have developers been demanding more of over the last couple months? And what do you think you're going to be offering a year from now that you're not offering today? And I, I don't know if. Um, do you want to uh, take that? Yeah, sure. So if what we're seeing, I mean, maybe not limit this to the last month, but certainly over the last six months, we've seen almost to a man now every, every developer that we talk to is wanting to go cross-platform. So mm. it might seem like a given, but you know, up until relatively recently, there were still a fair number of developers that were all about the iOS platform. Um, and now you know, they're definitely in the minority. Everyone wants to go to iPhone and Android, and an increasing number want to go to you know, other platforms like Windows Phone as well. Mm -hmm. In terms of where, you know, where we want to go in the future, I think you know, what the guys at AppCelerator have done is quite a smart move. We're seeing that developers are getting quite confused. There's this whole cloud of kind of network services that they need to actually monetize their mobile apps is getting quite a difficult space to navigate, I think, especially for a smaller developer. So being able to offer a kind of joined up solution that gives them a lot of that stuff out of the box, I think, Are is, you is quite a powerful thing. Are you offering a monetization solution as well? Not right now. We, we rely on a kind of um, yeah. ecosystem of partnerships. But I think making that space a little bit more navigable is definitely a good idea. Right. There's like 30 different providers that all do something yeah, slightly at different. Least. different. <laughs> well, at yeah. least 30. Everyone, I mean, yeah. everyone I talk to says they use at least 30 different yeah. channels. Um, what, about, what about you, Jeff? Yeah, I mean, clearly, uh, we've made big investments this year in the cloud. That's mm -hmm. a big part. Um, listening to our customers, it's you know, um, the application, getting the application um, built is always a first order problem, but now it's about how do you connect those applications to really interesting um, backend services, um, especially as you move towards enterprise applications. There's a lot of infrastructure in the enterprise that needs to, to, to be connected into and business process to, 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 and workflows to actually connect into mobile apps, uh, especially in business and, and, and employee-oriented apps. But even consumer apps, you're having more and more connectivity into different types of cloud capabilities, whether it's urban airship on the push side and, and loyalty side, or whether it's um, um, using things like uh, in-bass services, like pre-built services, or it's third-party services like social, like Facebook and others. So you've got this multi multiple cloud scenario that you're having to do. And doing all that orchestration in the client or in the application is becoming not scalable, right? So most of that processing needs to move into the cloud uh, and leverage these re reusable and pre-built services. So we've made some big investments there. Um, the, the other part of the investments we've made and what we're seeing this next year is really around life cycle, you know, kind of what happens post the app build. Um, how do you really actually, as more as we go from having one or two big apps inside of an enterprise to literally hundreds of applications, whether they're consumer delivered or employee delivered, um, you, you end up thinking about the software development lifecycle test, um, performance, um, management, operations of those applications long, over long periods of time. And so 
um, those, are, those are some of the areas that we're thinking about and investing in. Mm -hmm. In our case, uh, it's the recognition for companies that uh, app quality isn't just a testing challenge. Uh, and I think the market is starting to recognize that it's not just a testing challenge. And so last August, we bought a company called AppHance. Uh, that's actually tools for mobile developers to do things like over-the-air build distribution, automated crash reporting, in-app bug reporting, and user feedback, uh, and actually tying that back into the, the efforts of the in-house team. So they're getting these inputs from either pre-production, their testing team, or, or in production from their users, uh, and, and that, that's a necessary ingredient to the notion of in-the-wild app quality, where apps work as well in the hands of users as you think they do, or as they do in your lab. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, our, our business has changed a lot in the last year. And, uh, you know, if you, I think if you went out to the market a year ago and said, you know, what does Urban Airship do? It's push for developers. And what we found over the last year is that, uh, you know, this channel, this mobile channel is really starting to mature. And what happens is the marketers then come with their deeper pockets and their just insatiable appetite for, you know, reporting and understanding how they can drive engagement and campaigns over time. And so, you know, we've really focused on that, both at the app level, but, but you know, most recently uh, in November, we did an acquisition of a company called Tello that builds uh, pass tools, so managing pass books. So, so we see this as more than just apps. It's about how do you engage consumers, and, and passes are a great, great way to kind of, you know, try before buy. Uh, mm -hmm. from, from a, a brand perspective on mobile. It's also, it also really opened up our market for us because we didn't have to think about our customers, our people who have apps in market, have budget, you know, all those kinds of things. Much, much easier for us to get up and running with those folks. And then that leads to other things that we can do with them. I think, we, so we were on a panel a month ago when you were talking about uptick and demand for um, passbook tools. And so I'm curious if you saw anything interesting over the holiday period in terms of consumer Yeah, I think th there's been a, a couple interesting stories that have come out. Uh, you know, during the, the Major League playoffs, uh, about 12% of the, the redemptions of tickets at the gates for the, those playoff games were uh, done with passes. Mm -hmm. uh, American Airlines, uh, Wired did an article most, uh, about a week ago, I think, uh, and American Airlines is doing about 20,000 passes a day. Uh, and then Sephora is another great example. They, they've got uh, about 385,000 uh, users of their pass, so they have their, their loyalty stuff on there, so they have their points and all that. And what's happening is that's actually driving app installs. Um, Walgreens saw the same thing. Uh, they, they, they saw about a million new app installs just from their passes um, because it's one way to, it's just a different way to engage with the consumer and they go, wow, I want to do more with, with this brand. Mm -hmm. And then what about um, behavior with push notifications over the holidays? I mean, that's a very, very super competitive period where everyone's trying to reach everyone on Christmas or the day before or the week before. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're really sensitive to the, this channel. And, you know, we're, we're very, uh, you know, we think hard about channel fatigue and, and, you know, definitely educating our customers on the best practices for how to engage uh, with folks through, through these devices. But, I mean, we, we had, you know, hands down our biggest month ever. Um, we sent, you know, north of 4 billion notifications. Um, we added probably, you know, 15%, you know, more installs. We now are, are managing well over a billion active installs right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the growth has just been insane. And for us, the future is really more what we can do with this data and how we, how we leverage location and, uh, you know, behavior and uh, all of that over time um, mm -hmm. to help provide a, a better picture for the marketer on how they can engage with consumers through mobile. Mm -hmm. okay. Cool. Back to, to Jeff, and, um, you know, in transitioning or in, in launching your mobile back in the service um, um, offering this year, it's, it seems to me like a, a pretty crowded, it's, it to, at least to me it seems like a crowded market. You've got Parse and Convey and StackMob and all these other providers. What, what happens to that market like a year to 24 months from now? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, wish I, I wish I knew. I mean, I, I, you know, I think that it is a crowded market, but it's, a, it's, uh, it's probably because it's an it's a interesting and, and large opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, the cloud is quite disruptive uh, for mobile. If you think about mobile, it's hard to imagine mobile without thinking about cloud. They, they sort of go hand in hand together. So um, I also think that there's a massive amount of, of reusable services and, and, and things that need to happen cross-platform, especially as you have more and more devices, um, and having a set of common services in the cloud uh, and an ability to actually be able to connect those up very quickly uh, is a natural gravitational pull that happens in technology. So I think there's a... It certainly can be a crowded market. I think we're, we're different uh, from some of the other providers. A, we work with all those providers. We've, we've done integrations with Parse and StackMob and Convey, um, and we have customers that use them, and that's a very important philosophical point for us is having a stack that a customer can really choose an open mm -hmm. stack to determine how they want to actually build their infrastructure. Um, 
The second part is we, we're actually really delivering a, a complete kind of end-to-end -end solution, right? So while you can use our cloud without Titanium and while you can use Titanium without our cloud, um, ultimately most of our enterprise customers choose us because they want to do end-to-end. -end. They want something that kind of works end-to-end -end from an enterprise stack standpoint. Um, so I think there's plenty of opportunity in the market for, for everybody. I think MBAS itself probably is one part of a larger cloud offering from a mobile standpoint. Um, I don't think it's standalone, uh, you know, an interesting enough product area. I think you actually have to build a lot more value around that. We've made a lot of investments in this last six months around a Node.js PaaS stack that complements the uh, MBAS stack so that you can actually build, not only can you build um, or leverage pre-built uh, mobile services, um, you can also build your own and host them and get scale from that. So mm -hmm. that, those go really hand in hand. And it happens to actually work well for us because we've really invested in JavaScript and Titanium as a way to actually build native applications. And then now with Node.js and the, uh, the MBAS services, we actually have a JavaScript on the back end. So from an enterprise, it can actually leverage JavaScript on both the front end and the, and the back end. And with some of the things that we're doing around performance and test and profiling and debugging, you can actually now go end to end. So not only can you debug and profile the front end of the application, you actually take that all the way into the cloud. So I think that's where as these things get more and more complicated and these, these capabilities get more and more entrenched and important to the business, you actually have to grow and continue to grow the stack and, and its capabilities. So. I actually got a question from, um, I think, someone in the audience like right before this panel, and they were asking, like, is there going to be a BA, BA of mobile? I hope so. I hope it's <laughs> <up solar. laughs> I don't well, know. There's, there, you know, I think there is a, we, we, we strongly have conviction that there is a new mobile enterprise stack. If you think about the enterprise today, it's not just the technology, the business mm -hmm. models are changing with cloud and SaaS delivery. Um, certainly mobile is changing how people interface with technology, whether it's people or processes. Um, and certainly we think that that requires really a new way of building enterprise software um, that doesn't mean that Oracle and BA are going to go anywhere. Certainly, they're, they're entrenched in the enterprise, just like the mainframe still is in a lot of cases. Uh, but we think there, you, you can't physically take old enterprise software and just virtualize it and put it in the cloud and really call it a modern mobile-first cloud. You actually mm -hmm. have to really rethink. And that's really the opportunity, I think, for a lot of us on this panel is what does that look like, um, whether it's delivered via a consumer app or a business app. It's really what does that new enterprise stack look like. So I think there is a massive opportunity for companies to actually rebuild that enterprise stack in a way that BEA did in the, in, in the early days of the web. Um, and what, at what point do you think um, consolidation in this market would make sense? Is it still too early to see some of these other players get rolled up into a bigger entity? Yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing consolidation. I mean, you know, yeah. we've, we've, we've seen consolidation at multi-tiers. I think it's a really, really early market. I mean, I think if, if we really look at um, the internet and how long it took to build. Mm -hmm. I certainly think that the mobile, uh, the mobile industry is going to grow much, much faster. It's a much bigger opportunity. We've all, a lot of us uh, executives are building companies that have lived through the internet in some ways. We know this story. We know how it's going to probably pay out, at least in the macro side. Um, there's seven billion people on the planet. There's already a billion smartphones in mm -hmm. people's, you know, people's hands, and that's growing really, really super fast, right? So. I think that there's a, a massive opportunity. So when you have massive opportunities and you have major incumbents that are, the, you know, the Oracles and the SAPs and the, and the traditional companies out there, VMwares, et cetera, um, they have to fundamentally change uh, several things. One is they have to recognize that all those applications are going to move to mobile. A second is all that infrastructure is going to move to the cloud. Um, and so those are two kind of opposing different things. And the third is the business models are widely different. We're not selling perpetual software anymore. Largely, we're moving to much more of a SaaS-delivered, consume-as-you-need-to type business model. So those three sort of those three forces are all kind of hitting at the same time. And so what that does, what that means is that there's going to continue to be a consolidation. There's going to be consolidation by the big companies and the small companies that need to continue to innovate to preserve their position. And there's going to be small companies that are going to become the next. Um, oracles and Googles of the, of the mm -hmm. world in this space. How, how do you think about the risk of Amazon um, entering the space with Ada, some version of AWS? Um, you know, as far as mobile backend as a yeah, service? Yeah. Or, yeah, I mean, I think they will. They should. That would be smart, right? I mean, I think they continue to have to innovate in their platform. And, and what you, you tend to always hear from developers is, you know, I want to spend my energy, my time, my investments in things that really derive value in my application or my back end, whatever those things may be, um, not the underlying technology at the end of the day. And so that's why companies like ours exist, right, is to, is to provide more productivity, whether it's through developers or through enterprise or through connectivity or whatever, 
um, so that the company and ultimately developers and testers and project leaders, et cetera, can actually spend time on growing something and, and investing in things that actually drive more value for their business, whether it's driving new revenue or reducing costs from the enterprise, and often both. So I think that um, Amazon has to continue to move up the stack, um, and they have to continue to provide these levels of service. I think that's okay. That's a good thing for the I, market. I don't know. I, th I think Amazon's actually going to go wide. You know, they're, they're sort of a mile wide and an inch deep. Mm -hmm. Right, and we, we see so many. Um, like, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of startups, and for us, we were in, in AWS for like 20 minutes before we were like, "Oh God, we have to get off this." So we had to go to like managed infrastructure, and you know, I think we see the same thing. You know, they've entered a bunch of different markets, and then everybody goes, "Oh my gosh, Amazon's going to dominate that market," and then they don't because they have all this stuff that they're trying to do, and now they've bitten off the Kindle Fire, and you know, is there going to be a phone coming? Probably, right? So there's more that they have to do there. And if they're going to develop a set of services, well, they probably have to first do it for the Kindle devices, which is you know, a major pain. Uh, so th yeah, they, they may move into you know, other areas like what AppCelerator is doing, but it's, it's going to take forever. And in mm -hmm. the meantime, you know, Jeff and his team are just building up the stack and, and locking up all these customers. So um, I think it'd be really tough for Amazon to come in there and do that. Yeah, but you can say that it, it's a mile wide and an inch deep, but AWS is, is you know, gaining a good deal of, of mind share and market share. On the crowdsourcing side, I could say the same thing about Mechanical Turk. Oh, well, you know, it's digital <laughs> ditch digging. Yeah, but it, it is a formidable crowdsourcing uh, offering for certain spaces. I, I think any time a company has those types of resources, you, you have to take it seriously, not as a competitive threat, but as a, a potential disruptor or innovator. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately, I think in technology, choice is actually the, the, the best thing that actually happens in technology, especially if you're talking about more modern open technology, is that you can choose and to assemble the stack in the way you want. That's why we thought that open source and open standards are very important. That's why we really tried to make it really an open architecture where it's extensible. Um, I think that ultimately gives the, uh, the choice to the buyer on how they want to assemble it. If they want to leverage Amazon or Rackspace, it ultimately ends up being them, right? And so I think that's really a good thing for everybody in the industry. Mm -hmm. So actually, let's, let's talk about, let's switch over to another part, another type of service. Let's talk about testing. Um, yesterday, we talked about this. I wrote this article a few months back where there was this Hong Kong developer named Annie Mocha. And one day, they just took a picture of their conference room with all of their Android devices, and it was... 400 across an entire conference table, and it, it just inflamed a bunch of Android developers. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to ask, I mean, is it getting any better? No. <laughs> this, is, this is where the F-bombs start. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's not. Just Talked drop about it. Drop it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not getting better, and it's not going to get better. If you're waiting for <laughs> fragmentation to, to slow or actually diminish, you're going to be waiting at that bus stop for a while. Um, because the OEMs have every incentive, and, and in some cases even the, the OS providers have every incentive to keep making money, to keep innovating, there's going to be more and more fragmentation. Uh, and even if that weren't true in a specific platform like Android, um, four years ago when we talked about uh, mobile, we were talking about smartphones, and that begat tablets, and now there's all sorts of hybrids in between. You just introduced me to a terrible new term. The phablet. The phablet. Oh, <laughs> oh, Let's not let kill that me. stick. Yeah, nobody write that. <laughs> Um, but even beyond that, you get into gaming consoles and connected TVs yeah, and connected smart car. appliances and wearable technology and connected cars. You know, GM just announced an SDK uh, where they actually want to introduce an entirely new type of application. So by and large, I think that, that form, factor, form factor doesn't matter. Smartphone, it's not about mobile. It's not about smartphones. Uh, form factor is going to continue to, to fragment uh, at an alarming and increasing rate. Um, and so developers and, and companies that are producing these apps are, are going to have to learn how to digest that. And frankly, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big reason why we've had so much traction and success with big and, and medium brands is the fact that, you know, USA Today doesn't have a mobile app. They have 14 different apps across mm -hmm. iOS and Android and BlackBerry and Windows Phone, Kindle Fire, Barnes & Noble Nook, four different flavors for connected TV. And you know what they've built in house, uh, they can take their, they can they can go to an app accelerator and get help uh, on the dev fragmentation side. They can work with outside creative and get help on the design fragmentation side. When it comes to testing, fragmentation is not a, a temporal thing. It's not a blip on the radar where we're going to look back and say, oh my God, wasn't 2012 terrible? We're going to look back at 2012 and say, do you remember the good old days? Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a fundamental problem. Uh, the other. The other parallel to that is that users' expectations uh, have risen faster in mobile than they have with the web. We were all pretty tolerant users that like, oh, it works in Netscape, you know, it didn't work in IE. 
in mobile, we expect it to be like a light switch. You know, we expect mm -hmm. the app to work anytime, anywhere, for anyone. What's a realistic testing strategy for, you know, an indie developer and then mid-size and then large, like large brand or enterprise? Yeah, when we talk about in the wild testing, we don't think of it as instead of in the lab testing. There's still a, a great deal of, of debugging that you can do in the, you know, in the IDE. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of in the lab testing, whether it's automated or manual, it's, it's essential. Uh, we just think that it's, it's insufficient on its own. Mm -hmm. And so we think that an appropriate strategy for anyone who wants to have success in a world where app quality leads to user satisfaction, which leads to the word of mouth that we heard about in earlier sessions, you have to have a portfolio approach of in the lab testing and in the wild testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I think one thing you were saying was also that location is now becoming another parameter that you have to just consider uh, yeah, as a network. I, I, yeah. Your, the, the photo that you included in your article was, I don't know, hundreds of Android devices. And you can do that in a lab environment. You can go by every phone across every carrier and all the data plans and all the operating system permutations. And that's great, but if you have any kind of location-based awareness or geo-intelligence built in, um, then the lab can only replicate so much. And so I might know how it works in, uh, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, but that doesn't tell me what happens when users are roaming in Canada or they're driving down Highway 101, jumping from tower to tower, or they're in Manhattan uh, with congested AT&T networks. And it's a fundamentally different use case. Uh, and when I mentioned users having high expectations, there's no sensitivity or forgiveness to, oh, I'm sure it's AT&T, or I'm sure the Twitter, you know, Twitter changed its API, and that's probably why that Twitter stream isn't working. They say, no, you know, brand X, you suck. How do you do the in the wild testing for your clients? So we do our in the wild testing uh, through a crowdsourcing model. We have 70,000 testers from 190 countries around the world. Uh, they're professional testers with an average of five years experience, uh, and they profile themselves. They tell us where they're from, what languages they speak, demographics, hardware, software, things like that. So that when Google comes to us and says, I have a new iPad application, I want to test it in Poland, Portugal, Peru, and Pittsburgh, uh, on these three versions of iPad, on these carriers, we can match them with the testers that not only have the right hardware, software connectivity, uh, they actually have a track record um, in, in that space. They've actually done successful work for other clients in that space. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about in the wild testing, the notion of it is it's not instead of in the lab testing, it's breaking off a portion of your testing, moving it outside the lab closer to where your users work and live and play. Mm -hmm. Um, and this question is for Tim and Jeff, but last night we were talking about, um, you know, how you help, you know, larger game developers port their titles, um, and then we were talking about discussion of, well, does, is, is write once run anywhere? How, is that actually, are we getting any closer to that being a reality? Um, yeah, yeah, so we were saying, you know, that phrase has become kind of devalued, and rightly so, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, I think what technology can do, um, you know, like Marmalade or Accelerator or other technologies can get you to a point where you can kind of get a photocopy of your app, if you like, across uh -huh. the different platforms and devices, um, which saves you a whole bunch of time and money, uh, but it's not going to get you the app that you ultimately deploy on the store, right? You still need to, there's an optimization phase, there's a testing phase, um, but, you know, a percentage of that time and money you've saved in not having to port Objective-C code to Java, you can reinvest that mm -hmm. <coughs> in optimizing for the device, which is ultimately the thing that's going to deliver value to your end user, right? Because the end user doesn't see or care how your app was built. You know, did you port from Objective-C to Java? How did you manage that? They don't, they don't see that. What they see is the fact that, yeah, you've really optimized that UI layout for a landscape, you know, an Android tablet or whatever, as opposed to just dumping the same UI from your, from your iPhone, portrait, whatever. Um, so so yeah. typically, I mean, after they use Marmalade, I mean, how long does it take and how, how you know, how many extra steps do they have to take before they can actually bring, you know, an app to market? So, with a yeah, so it depends on the scale of the, of the app and, uh -huh. you know, and how, how big the, Just how experienced the, the company is. But yeah, I mean, it's like, maybe it's like 15% of your development time, really, is that, is that kind of final optimization phase. So we're, we're arguing that we can get you, you know, like an 80 to 85% saving mm -hmm. as, as opposed to doing a brute force port from iPhone SDK to Android tooling or to Windows 8 tooling. Mm -hmm. What about? It's about, I mean, I would agree with Tim. It's about the same for us as well. I mean, it's 70 to 90% reusability. And, and more importantly, it's a common uh, set of code, common reusable capabilities, and, and, and a common set of resources. Um, and so that ends up being often, you know, having an Android team and a Windows 8 team and an iOS team and no code reusability and three different schedules that you need to line up. And that ends up being a lot of the complexity of, of the alternative to what uh, one of, uh, you know, one of our products would provide. 
um, but I think it's very similar. And, it's, and that, that ends up being uh, an important part, right? Sometimes it's not just the code that ends up being the hardest part. It's all these other things that surround it that, uh, and it's also agile, right? We want to be able to actually produce and, and, and create applications in a time that allows us to be market sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that, that often ends up being also very important. Mm -hmm. The key thing is, is also when, you know, in today's world of, you know, user retention and engagement where you're having to update the app frequently, you know, maybe historically you could have got, got away with a kind of serial platform approach where you build it on iPhone. If it succeeds in the market to a certain extent, you do a brute force port to Android and you release on that platform like six months later. But in a world where you're updating your app every month or even every couple of weeks, mm -hmm. which especially is true for games now, you know, freemium games and um, these kind of models, you really need to be working, uh, have, a, have a development workflow that lets you deploy simultaneously your app update across platforms. And that's only really possible if you're using some kind of cross-platform tooling. Mm -hmm. cool. I think we are leaving some time for questions. I don't know if anyone has any. Oh, we have a question over there. Hey, um, my question is around files in the mobile world. Um, we've had this notion of with Dropbox and with Box and some of these file storage providers on the web side. What about on the mobile side of the house in terms of productivity applications? We've heard a lot about, um, you know, like ordering stuff on like e-commerce and stuff like that. But this notion of file interoperability in the mobile side of the house, do you think the surface like use cases that Microsoft tried to push to the tablet? is going to gain adoption, or is mobile purely going to be a consumption use case of discovery and uh, reading information? So you're asking if file sharing or productivity on apps mobile. will gain popularity? Correct. OK. Yeah, I mean, I'll start. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, if the question is really around interoperability and standards, uh, you know, who knows, right? It's, uh, it's up to the companies that are really playing in that space to decide if that makes sense. It does make sense, probably, if they want to interoperate between application sharing. Um, and there's a bunch of different schemes for being able to do that, at least in iOS. Um, and then Intense and Android for being able to share data and things like that. But, but definitely, I think the, the mobile device is going to continue to push the boundaries beyond just consumption and, and more into productivity and capabilities that, that you know, are beyond just basic uh, consumption models. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say that if there's market demand for it, and I think clearly there is, I think mobile has already proven that when it comes to content consumption, you know, that, that's the, the primary theme of use cases as opposed to necessarily content creation or manipulation. Things like interoperability, things like connectivity, those problems will be solved if there's a market there and there's money to be made, and I think in that, that case there clearly is. You know, and I, I would say, too, just to maybe add on one more thing. I mean, the, the mobile device probably is the biggest uh, content creation device that we have out there today, especially if you look at certain use cases like photos. Um, you know, it's massive amounts of, and certainly things like Twitter creates content and uh, Facebook creates content. And, and so then it's a matter of, you know, what are the different content use cases for creation that happens over time? And then that becomes potentially about the device capabilities. Uh, but certainly, it's probably the biggest content creation device that exists now on the planet. This is uh, kind of a low-level question, but um, in operator forum lately, there's a lot of focus on um, managing congestion and Wi-Fi offload. And I, I'm, that might be too low level for you guys, but just sort of open-ended question: whether you see any opportunity there to sort of step up and show leadership, sort of managing that. Um, we have no, no, no plans to do anything related to carriers. <laughs> we try to stay as away, far away from those as we can. Yeah, same. I, I think the, 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 the problem in the carrier market is, is we need the operators to be very healthy and, and, and have a good, healthy business model for, for this space to actually continue to grow at the rate it's going to grow, where it's machine to machine or you know, person to machine type um, interaction. So, um, I think that's a struggle that they're having is as, these, as this data explodes, especially in video uh, with mobile devices, how do they actually continue to provide a level of service from an end user standpoint, but potentially when the economics underneath that aren't changing at all, so, but the costs are exploding on top of them. So. Do we have any other Oh, we have one right here. Uh, 
A question for Tim and Jeff. Um, uh, the, uh, the challenge with the framework is, is, is using a framework for the first time. Uh, using it for the second time, the application, is, it, the, the first application is like the first, pa first pancake. Um, how do you avoid failure <laughs> with the first uh, application with a framework? I like that. Uh, well, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, there's no magic bullet there, right? But I mean, the approach that we take uh, is we've built our platform around kind of open standards. So we're not providing like, you know, a proprietary scripting language or an entirely new set of APIs. We're, provi we're providing an SDK that supports all the C++ standard libraries. So, you know, in fact, about half our licensees don't even build their app, the, the entire app within Marmalade itself. They're taking existing C++ code or C code, whether that's open source libraries, entire open source engines like Cocos 2D or Box 2D and things, and they're bringing those into Marmalade and all that code will just compile and run. And then, of course, they're adding additional stuff. And yes, they're calling some of our new APIs that they have to learn but they're not having, you know, and, and we work within existing IDEs, so we're not providing our own IDE, that you're using Xcode on the Mac or you're using Visual Studio on Windows, so all of that stuff is familiar. Um, so yeah, that helps to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, it's similar for us. I mean, it's, it's always hard. I mean, what we focused on is doing a few things. One is, um, you know, we've built a big community of, uh, of lots of developers, 400,000 developers now that use Titanium. So that provides a lot of scale for the community to be able to help, um, you know, help others. Um, and then, of course, we invested pretty heavily in training and enablement and things like that. But any, any new technology, I would say that's the same, is you actually have to learn the technology and, and learn how it works well to get value out of it, whether it's iOS and Objective-C, which very few people had seen four years ago, or it's, you know, some new technology will come out soon. I mean, the, count, the counter argument is, you know, if you want to, if you imagine a world where, you know, we've got three platforms, say, say it's Windows, iOS, and Android, and you're using the platform native tooling, that's three bespoke, proprietary, separate, you know, languages, tools, APIs that your team as a whole has got to learn. Whereas if you choose a cross-platform um, tool set, you know, it's, it might be new, but it's one new thing as opposed to having to learn three separate things. I think we have time for just one more question. Anyone's got one? Okay. I don't think anyone has any other questions, but if anyone wants to throw out if you have a prediction for where, you know, how this conversation will be different from, you know, a year from now. <laughs> Is it simply a matter of just uniform growth or do we actually see, um, you know, more consolidation in the space? I think, yeah, I agree with um, what was said earlier that the fragmentation is going to get worse. worse. I mean, some of us here may imagine, kind of remember the pre-iPhone day yeah. where there was like, uh, you know, J2ME and everyone was saying, oh, this is terrible. You know, nothing could ever be as bad as J2ME. <laughs> and, you know, and in fact, Google were determined that Android was not going to be the new J2ME, right? And they've succeeded to a certain extent in terms of the implementation of Android and, and uh, you know, the, the, the APIs operate consistently or more consistently. But the form factor explosion and how people are mangling Android and, you know, the way OEMs are, are trying to differentiate by poking things and breaking things as far as the developer is concerned. Is only is only going to get worse. So you so know, it hopefully, just got better before it got worse again. Yeah, <laughs> it collapsed down to iPhone, and that was good for a while for developers, but now it's opened back up again. Cool. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for, for coming on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.